so hot it can boil iron, so noisy it can be heard 60 miles away, and so dangerous it's hosed down with a million gallons of water every three minutes. Rocket testing, suffice it to say, is quite an intense process. But what actually goes down at a typical modern testing facility? Join us today as we get all fired up for a look at how space rockets are tested. This month marks the 60th anniversary of Russian cosmonaut Yuri Alexeyevich Gagarin's pioneering first flight into space. So you'd be forgiven for thinking rocketry was pretty well understood by now. Well, there's actually still a very long way to go. Vast new rockets from SpaceX's awesome Starship to NASA's moon-bound SLS giant are grander than anything attempted during the old-school space race. There's also different mission priorities these days, and even different fuel sources. As such, the latest generation rocket engines, be they Elon Musk's mighty Raptors or Uncle Sam's RS-25s from the shuttle program, need to be rigorously put through their paces on terra firma before they're trusted with precious payloads, and of course, delicate human beings. Rocket tests fall into two broad categories, sea level ambient and altitude. This distinction is critical, because air pressure is greater at sea level than way up off the ground. At altitude, rockets produce more thrust in the thinner air and have to cope with less heat transfer, and these factors have major engineering implications. For sea level tests, the ambient atmospheric conditions surrounding the test area work fine. But testing rockets at altitude is a lot more challenging, as technicians need to simulate conditions way up in the blue sky, but on the ground where they can actually analyse them. For this, rockets are placed in a sealed chamber, where the pressure is sucked out with mechanical pumps to around 0.16 PSA, roughly equivalent to the prevailing conditions 100,000 feet above sea level. This sealed environment obviously creates its own problems, so a process known as inerting is introduced, whereby gaseous nitrogen or helium is fed into the chamber to prevent explosive buildup of rocket exhaust matter. Whichever type of test, sea level or altitude, that ferocious exhaust needs to be directed somewhere, typically into a so-called flame bucket or trench. This funnels the heat and energy in a direction where it can't do any harm. The particular fuel source of the rocket is a big determinant in how the rocket is oriented during the test. Liquid rocket engines are typically fired in a vertical position, as gravity is all part of the fuel intake process. Solid rocket engines, alternatively, can be fired horizontally, which requires a smaller and cheaper flame trench. However, this comes with its own issues, not least noise, which we'll come to shortly. So, where actually are these testing grounds? Most modern rocket testing facilities are situated in the southern United States in order to be near launch sites, which themselves are frequently close to the Earth's equator. Why are launch sites near the equator? The land around the equator moves at around 1,670 kilometers per hour, while halfway towards the poles, the land only moves 1,180 kilometers per hour. This means launching from the equator helps spacecraft blast off already 500 kilometers per hour faster without additional input of energy. As such, SpaceX has a large rocket testing facility in McGregor, Texas, which is handy for the company's Boca Chica launch and assembly site. But today we'll mostly be focusing on NASA's John C. Stennis Space Center in Hancock County, Mississippi. This is where new SLS rockets are being tried out in preparation for the first Artemis launches later this year, part of an ambitious program to put the first woman and next man on the moon in the next three years. Stennis has a fine pedigree in this regard, as it was where rocketry for the first and second stages of the Saturn V lunar landing were tested back in the 1960s. The magnificent landmark A and B test stands are even registered as official National Historic Landmarks. From 1975 to 2009, Stennis also tested the main engines that powered 135 missions of the iconic NASA Space Shuttle. Indeed, those same RS-25 engines that powered the shuttle, with some choice upgrades naturally, will hopefully be sending the SLS to the moon soon. The facility is so integral to American space law, it's said by proud Stennis workers, if you want to go to the moon, you first have to go through Hancock County, Mississippi. Stennis is indeed perfectly situated for rocket testing. It's isolated from major population centers on a 13,800-acre site surrounded by a 125,000-acre buffer zone. There's great access by road and seven and a half miles of specially dug canals, plenty of local water, a supportive local government and a climate that suits testing, at least when hurricane season isn't in full swing. So what happens in the actual test? During the recent SLS warm-ups at Stennis, a variety of rocket systems were checked over. Modal testing is a way of assessing the overall structural integrity of components, essentially by striking them with a finely calibrated mallet and measuring their resonant frequency. If the frequency is off in some way, it could suggest faulty welds, cracks or other problems that might jeopardize the ultimate mission. 
There's a so-called power-up procedure that must be followed to make sure everything comes on correctly and in the right sequence. The avionics, that is the onboard mechanics and electronics, must all be tested and thrown phony curveballs to reveal any unforeseen weaknesses. A crucial aspect of rocket avionics is the gimballing system, which orients the rocket boosters in order to maintain overall trajectory. This system has its own self-contained hydraulics and must be tested thoroughly. A series of simulated countdowns will take place, ramping up to a so-called wet dress rehearsal, where propellants are flowed into the engine but not ignited. To facilitate the SLS tests at Stennis, some 700,000 gallons of propellant, that's 200,000 gallons of liquid oxygen and 500,000 gallons of liquid hydrogen, are piped in from six floating barges. That's about 114 tanker trucks worth. At the moment of ignition, when the rocket does finally fire, technicians need to keep an eye on some fairly hair-raising physical changes to the rocket. With temperatures ranging from minus 400 degrees Fahrenheit, thanks to that liquid fuel source, then rising to a few thousand degrees Fahrenheit while alight, the metal tank can grow and shrink by several inches. That infernal exhaust will then jet into the flame chute, requiring two separate suppression systems, both fed by a dedicated 66 million gallon reservoir. 240,000 gallons of water every minute gets pumped over the chute to cool the engine exhaust during testing. In addition to that, some 92,000 gallons of water a minute are sprayed through a separate nozzle system to suppress noise. This noise suppression isn't just to help the local property prices, it's to prevent all that acoustic energy disrupting the finely calibrated test equipment or affecting the material performance of the rocket itself. Those gigantic plumes of white smoke you see emanating from Stennis testing rigs are in fact steam from that colossal torrent of much-needed cool water. Stennis has its own high-pressure industrial water facility to manage this aspect of its operation, by the way, and a high-pressure gas facility of HPGF that helps pump gaseous nitrogen into the core stage during testing. This prevents outside air entering the testing zone during those all-important altitude tests. As well as the mechanical side, special software is also deployed during testing to control the avionics and simulate the different atmospheric conditions the rocket may find itself subject to. Software is believed to be the reason French rocket Ariane 5 suffered a disastrous mid-air mishap in June 1996, so there's a lot at stake here. All these processes working in concert should help run a test that produces, in the case of the SLS, 1.6 million pounds of thrust, or 2 million pounds at altitude, consuming as it fires some 2.6 million litres of propellants. Thrust is measured using the TMS, or Thrust Measurement System, which uses a series of load cells to calculate how much upward movement the thrust generates with fuel weight taken into account. Once rocket firing is complete, the real work begins. Some 1,400 sensors arrayed across the test site produce terabytes of data which technicians can pore over in order to make subtle refinements ahead of the big launch. The impact of rocket testing, in particular at Stennis, goes far beyond just firing payloads into space, by the way. The on-site Advanced Technology and Technology Transfer branch was founded by NASA to develop and share the knowledge acquired at Stennis in a way that enriches daily life for everybody, not least the Mississippi economy. In 2018 alone, it's reckoned the work at Stennis benefited the local economy to the tune of $583 million. In case you thought it was just a load of pyromaniacs out there in the deep south having a blast. What do you think? Is the ground testing of rockets every bit as exciting as the lunar missions themselves? Let us know in the comments, and don't forget to subscribe for more upwardly mobile tech content.